Today is Sunday, June 20th, and this is Headers and Footers, the UEFA Euro 2020 show from the Toronto Star. I'm your host, Brendan Dunlop. Match day three started with two screens Sunday. How did you spend it? How did you watch the deciding day in Group A? A clash for top spot pitted Gareth Bale's Wales against one of the most impressive teams we've seen so far at this tournament, Italy. They knew they were already through to the knockout stage. We knew that meant that Roberto Mancini was going to experiment and rotate his squad a bit. He made eight changes to his starting 11. And they were just as dangerous this side. Marco Verratti and Federico Chiesa showed just how many starting options Mancini actually has to choose from in this team. They were both exceptional. If you had to pick a man of the match, probably Verratti after that performance. But Matteo Pessina, what a day for him. He'll never forget it. Scoring his third international goal and just his seventh cap for the Azzurri. He wasn't even supposed to be on the team. It's pretty incredible that he scored the lone goal and to see Italy run perfect through the group stage. I mean, this was an uphill battle for Wales from the get-go, and it got worse when Ethan Ampadu was sent off for his challenge on Bernardeschi in the 55th minute. It seemed harsh. seemed like a yellow would have been fair enough, but the Romanian referee sending off the Welshman, leaving Wales down to 10 men. And probably rocking the confidence of the 20-year-old. I really thought Ampadu was hard done by there. You can tell even Italy thought it was harsh. It really didn't matter how many men were on the pitch for Wales or how many secrets Juventus's Aaron Ramsey was sharing with his Welsh teammates about his opposition. There was no way they were going to unlock that Bonucci-led defense. There were a lot of questions coming into this tournament about the Azzurri. Plenty. And there are still a few. But the biggest question... After watching another clean sheet, three straight clean sheets from Italy, the real question is, how much better can this team get? It's scary to think about. Turkey were supposed to be better than we saw at Euro 2020. Now, they did test Swiss keeper Jan Sommer with a few good efforts in their match on Sunday. Sommer only just back in the Switzerland squad, having left the team to be with his wife for the birth, birth of their second child. Made it back in time. Thankfully for Switzerland, but I mean, Turkey's defense, they lost this game six minutes in. Turkey's defense was a mess again. And Seferovic silenced the very pro-Turkey crowd in Baku with a six-minute goal. Even Turkish fans, though, would have stood up, I think, and applauded the goal from Jerdan Shakiri, the Liverpool man with two on the day and one rocket of a strike that reminds you just how dangerous the little man can be. Turkey's goal difference at this tournament, minus seven, the worst of the European Championship 24 team era. If only the Swiss had found two more goals, they'd be sitting pretty right now. Switzerland finished third in Group A, so they'll have to wait on some other results to see if they can book their place in the last 16 as one of the best four third-place finishers. On four points with a minus-one goal differential, they do have a good shot. To recap the final day in Group A, I thought I'd bring on a face that Canadian football fans know very well and a voice that, if you've been watching TSN's wall-to-wall coverage of Euro 2020 in Canada, a voice that you know quite well. I'm very excited to chat with my guest today because we've not been able to speak on air in the past. We've worked the same events before. We've played co-ed league soccer together before, and now we can talk about Euro 2020 on headers and footers. So welcome, Matthew Shinetti. It's been too long a wait for this one, my friend. Yes, we've been on the soccer pitch quite a bit. We have both had uh, glorious and not so glorious moments on the pitch together, but it's good to talk uh, the beautiful game with you, brother. I've also uh, watched the Europa League final with you where you sang glory, glory, Man United. Now, am I just assuming based on the name that your allegiance here when it comes to international soccer is the Atsuri and not England? Well, you know, it's funny uh, you bring that up. Uh, this is an opportunity for me to share a little anecdote that you and I had back in 2018 when Italy did not qualify for the World Cup. And you asked me who I'd be cheering for. And I said, Manchester United. And you said, so England? And I said, Manchester United. And as you can see in the back, I have my United ball there, perfectly placed for you. Yes. Um, listen, I, you know, I was on college in St. Clair West in 2006 when they won the World Cup. But um, it's not that I don't have any allegiances to my cultural background. Uh, I just am not as passionate. I don't know if I could raise my level of passion as uh, some of my Italian brothers and sisters uh, often do this time of year. Uh, but honestly, the way they're playing, it's hard not to like this Italian team. Yeah, the parties on college in St. Clair in Toronto, just incredible because this Hatsuri side is, is really playing, I think, out of their skin. And uh, you've you've uh, covered all the teams and profiled all the teams on TSN's coverage. And you've, you've watched a lot of Serie A this year. Are you surprised by how Roberto Mancini has been able to get this team to play? Because I looked at this squad and thought, they're a good team, but 
against the big boys, I don't know how they would fare. And against the, you know, the tests that they've had in front of them, uh, they've been spectacular. One of the standout sides in the, in the tournament. No, no doubt. And, and I think that the interesting thing was watching them against Turkey, having remembered and, and obviously watched United and watched Mancini with Manchester City and the way that he had that team playing with the ball at their feet and the way, you know, since through qualifying, you know, Italy, obviously it's been said over and over again, has gone what, 10 games unbeaten and is now over a thousand minutes without conceding a goal. But the way they play so compact, it really is, to be honest, an anti-Italian way of playing. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they are so patient. They go forward and you watch, you know, Barella, Locatelli, um, you know, Spinazzola, the way that all of these guys, like relative unknowns. And I, and I mentioned this in, in one of the features I did. Usually when you come to a tournament at this point, there's always that one Italian player that most fans across the world would gravitate to, you know, Pirlo obviously being one. Remember from 2006, um, obviously Totti, Del Piero. But at this point, we're getting to know some of these players. And, you know, they're, they're not guys, you know, Manuel Locotelli, for example, and the way he played in the game against Switzerland. This, is, this isn't a guy who plays for one of the traditional powerhouses. Yes, he developed and he came through the Milan system, but he plays for a team, he plays for Sassuolo. Mm-hmm. And so this is an opportunity for a lot of fans of European soccer to learn about players who don't play for the traditional big three teams in Italy, Inter, AC Milan, and, and Juventus. But even watching today, you know, uh, Sergu coming in, the backup goalie who played for so long in Serie A and then went to play for PSG. The real key for this team has been this togetherness and watching Sergu come in and then, you know, in the 89th minute coming in for Donnarumma and to see how much the players really enjoyed that and to Mm -hmm. see them tease Sergu afterwards, you can tell that unlike previous Italian teams, because the cliche about Italy is always they're slow starters in tournaments and then they kind of get into their stride if they make it farther into the tournament. Uh, this team really, really looks good. And now you start bracket watching, right? And if you're, you know, you look into that round of 16 phase and it's, is Italy going to have a lot of trouble with either Ukraine or Austria from, from the other groups? No, that's who they would likely play against. But the big matchup in the quarterfinals could be Belgium. And I think that's, uh, that's going to be one to watch. Could be Belgium or how things shake down. It could be one of the powers from Group F, the way the brackets uh, scheduled out. But yeah, I was going to say that that was going to be my next point that, you know, great teams are measured against other great sides. We haven't really seen that. But also what we haven't seen from Italian teams in the past is this chemistry that you mentioned. And look what it meant to the whole squad when Pasina scored, who, you know, what wasn't supposed to be in the team and uh, nearly had a chance at uh, two first half goals there. I thought he was going to put that one off of his toe. So there really is a, a camaraderie and a connection. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that these players are from all over the Serie A and not just centralized with the big teams. And you could see that they really are kind of, you know, playing for each other. I think it's maybe a byproduct of this changing of the guard, given the fact that Italy didn't qualify for the 2018 World Cup, and that was like 50, 60 years since that had happened. And it really needed to be a a total remake of the lineup. And seriously, obviously painful seeing, if you're an Italian fan, you know, Buffon coming of age and leaving the side. But it was necessary because Mm -hmm. Mancini said it, and you can look through their qualifying. They didn't have one guy they relied on. The, The scoring was balanced throughout. And Menchi has said that I will, I want to be able to call on anybody at any moment. And it's bearing out the way they played. And, and to see in a game where they were up and they have obviously a man advantage after Wills takes a it, very interesting red card, um, given how much referees are really trying to go ahead and, and cut out the stamping of the feet in this tournament. And yet Italy didn't necessarily rush anything, didn't feel like they had to score more goals, although Balotti obviously had two or three good chances throughout the game and, and could have gone ahead and, and put Italy up. But just calmness, they knew what they wanted, more of a traditional Italian way of playing the game in this one. But I look at them in the round of 16, and I think they're frankly pretty dangerous. They are. I'm glad you mentioned Belotti because I've said to you before, he looks like he could be one of your brothers. If his if his name was Shinetti, I would have just assumed. What's, what's, what's the, the, he's got that, <laughs> that celebration of the rooster. So, yeah. <laughs> they're just they're just such a, a dangerous side and and there's not a there's not a team in this tournament be it belgium be it one of those powers in group f as i mentioned that want to come up against them and uh, my friend dan capobianco who we've played soccer with he texts uh, and saying that i was unfair to call this italy's b team because this is a2 uh, aside that's that's starting federico chiesa and marco Verratti, how could that possibly be a b team and i think that roberto mancini has a, a real luxury of options and a, you know, can really benefit from the fact that as i said these guys are all playing for each other and um you know have totally put the failures of 2018 in the, in the background and are fueled by you know writing their own history yeah and 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 coming off of that super saturday uh with a group of death and you know my condolences obviously to yeah, thank you portuguese national team um 
But if, if you're Italy and you're looking at that site, you're looking at the group of death, you're not intimidated by anybody. I mean, yes, certainly Germany is Germany, but traditionally Italy plays very well against Germany mm -hmm. and, you know, Portugal defensively, it never looks good when you get two own goals away, but also France as well. Like if Italy's, you know, I, I don't think given the way that Mancini's set up the side and the way he's been speaking in the media, he's going to be pumping anybody's tires more just like, okay, we're on to the next one. If we face Ukraine, if we faced Austria, we'll take care of it. But if you're an Italian fan and Italian fans never lack for confidence, especially now that their, their team is playing so well, scoring goals and not conceding any, um, I don't think you worry about anybody. But the one thing when you get into deeper into the tournament, what happens when Italy goes up against a team that's going to have a low block and just stack a bunch of guys in the box and Italy's going to have to take their time and be ponderous because that's kind of what Turkey did in that first game. Like Turkey let Italy come on them and yep. Italy was very methodical. And, you know, for the first time ever in the European championship scored three goals. So it's, it's, I'm interested to see how they deal with the pressure as it increases in the round of 16. Well, Turkey let everyone come at them. They crash out of the group with a three, one loss of the Swiss. Were they one of your dark horses, Turkey? You know what? I, I have a soft spot for Turkey after the two, uh, 2008 and semi took and what he did to Croatia. And, and, yeah. and I liked, I, I thought, yeah, you know, I thought they might be, but after that, after that first game, um, I was really disappointed. Like they just looked flat. And usually when you think of a Turkish team, you kind of think of a swashbuckling team. You think of, you know, the team, the 2002 world cup, the 2008 European championship team. Uh, and they were just flat and kind of watching out of the corner of my eye, some of the, the game against the Swiss. I mean, they just look flat and they just want to get back on the plane to Istanbul. And, and I guess one of the things, you know, it's such a Canadian year in soccer. If you're not, if you don't have Canadians on your team and you're a Turkish team, obviously Besiktas with Kyle Lahren and Atiba right. Hutchinson, you're not going to have a good year. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's cer certainly Turkey overall, big disappointment of the tournament. Good point. Yes, the Turkish Super League will be one for Canadians uh, to pay attention to, but the Turkish national team, not exactly the uh, entertaining or swashbuckling side as we thought. I want to ask you about the feature you did with Stephen Caldwell, neighbor versus neighbor ahead of England versus Scotland. What was it like working with Caldwell on that? Uh, so passionate. I mean, the one thing yeah. about, you know, Steve as well, if not better than I do, and uh, he loves his football. He loves his country. And having him talk about Kenny Dalglish and scoring a goal against Ray Clemens, having him talk about how Scotland went into Wembley after England had won the World Cup and the way they played, and just having a conversation with him about what the two national anthems meant, and it kind of it became a central part of the piece, um, how both national anthems were basically saying the same thing. If you've never heard the Flower of Scotland, it basically is a not a battle cry necessarily, but it, it's, it's a look at a harken back to a call to a previous time, hundreds of years ago, battles between England and Scotland, but there's an undertone that's not part of the lyrics in which there comes a point when Scotland fans just shout out England um, during the lyrics. And it's, it kind of feels like much like God save the queen. Like these two anthems are saying the same thing that the only fixation, if you're English, it's English superiority, or if you're Scottish, it's being England. Um, but, you know, you know, look if, if for Tuesday because Steve and I are working on another essay because that Scottish national side, the biggest, probably the biggest game that Scotland's ever played at Hampden Park when they go up against Croatia with an opportunity to get to uh, the knockout round for the first time in any major tournament. And Steve and I were talking and uh, we might have something for everybody come Tuesday. Okay, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I was already excited for that match, and I think that they've got a great chance because this is a Croatian side that is a shadow of the team that we saw you know, reach the final of 2018. I want to end on some rapid fire. Let's have some fun here, okay? I'm going to throw a few questions at you. No real surprises. I'll start with an easy one. Premier League or Serie A? Uh, Premier League, only because of my allegiance to United. There we go. Uh, the best match that you've been to in person? <sighs> The 2017 Carling Cup final, Manchester United against Southampton. I was I was there at Wembley Stadium when Zlatan Ibrahimovic scored the header to win. Uh, very quickly, I cheered so loudly that I strained my vocal cords, came back, had to do a live hit, and when I re when I went to the doctor and told her what had happened, she was not impressed. <laughs> That's great. I actually forgot you went to that game. I was expecting maybe an MLS Cup final or one of our nights at BMO Field, which feel ages ago. Uh, charity tournament pick. You can only have one X Pro. Caldwell. Or Julian de Guzman? You know what? I, I played alongside Julian for a, a game, but I, I would love to play. I have played with Steve before. Steve is just so supportive. I <laughs> You've played alongside me. I just run, and I don't have any technical ability. But Steve is so – he's a coach on the field. He's telling you where to run, what to do. And having played with him before, I'd play with him again. He recognizes that affirmation is key for guys like us. You're very, uh, very much so. He's got to pump our tires to get us going, yes. All right, we'll go Italian here. Biscotti or cannoli? Ooh, um, 
you know what? I'll go biscotti only because like, it's just, it's simple. It's quick. And uh, it hits the spot. Well, I'm eating all the cannolis that you've left on the table. You've, <laughs> you've only got, you've only got 30 minutes at the gym weights or cardio. Well, oh, I knew, oh, you know what? I'm going off the board. I'm doing 15 minutes of each. I don't care what the rules are. I'm going to do 15 minutes of each. All right. All right. Okay. And there's one you can laugh at me then. Uh, my hair better pre pandemic or now. I don't know. How about mine? <laughs> All I'm saying is that there's going to be, there's going to be a lot of barbers and salons uh, getting work when they're finally allowed to open up in July in Ontario. Every two weeks I'm getting a haircut, brother. I am not like for every 14 days, I'm getting a haircut for the rest of my life. This is, I, I, you know what, I'm not saying I'm bearing any cross with this hair, but I've had enough of it going into my ears and I see your glorious flow. I can only imagine how, how hard you have to tame that. I look like I should be coaching in the set of yeah, but uh, I've enjoyed watching this at Zuri, buddy. And that's something I've not uh, ever said, I think, in my life. And I've uh, also very much enjoyed chatting with you. So thanks for coming on Headers and Footers. It's been a long time since I've been on the pitch with Shinetti, or at all, actually. It's one of the things I'm very much looking forward to getting back to this summer. Fingers crossed. We will see England back on the pitch when Group D comes to a close on Tuesday. Today, Gareth Southgate actually made an announcement that Harry Kane, his captain, would start in their final game against the Czech Republic. Harry Kane has not looked himself at Euro 2020 at all. Not looked like the capable, dangerous forward that we see for Tottenham week in and week out in the Premier League. It's taken a lot of heat from the English media and certainly a lot of heat from England fans. Uh, strange, though, that a national team coach would have to come out to speak about a healthy player 48 hours before his team's fixture. Clearly a talking point inside and out of that England camp. But Harry Kane is the England captain, as I said. What message would that send if Gareth Southgate dropped him with his team sitting on four points heading into the final group game? It was never going to happen. Uh, I love what Stephen Caldwell said on TSN's post-game broadcast when talking about this. He said, it's just the English press's way of causing some real trouble, that there was not a chance that Harry Kane wouldn't start an England match in this tournament. Tomorrow, we'll see North Macedonia for the final time at Euro 2020. It's a debutante. We'll bow out in a Group C clash that wraps up first tomorrow when they take on the Netherlands. Expect Frank de Boer to take a page out of Mancini's book and heavily rotate his Dutch orange. Ukraine v. Austria, that'll be the early game to watch because second place in the group and an automatic trip through to the last 16 is on the line. A draw for Ukraine, that would be enough. Whereas David Alaba's Austria, they're going to have to play for the win here. Where will he be playing? That is the question. Because in the center of a back three, didn't work last time out, He's such a key player. David Alaba has to be more impactful on the pitch if Austria is going to have a shot at all. A win in St. Petersburg, that would book Finland's spot in the next round, but they're playing Belgium. And Belgium are one of the deepest teams at Euro 2020, so expect Roberto Martinez to still feel the strong 11 no matter who he throws out there on the pitch. A draw would be enough for Belgium to win the group, but if they do beat Finland, a win for Denmark then over Russia would put the Danes through in second place. And how incredible would that be for Denmark with all that they've been through? Two devastating losses on top of the Christian Eriksen collapse. It would just be amazing if Denmark was able to find that result and see Euro 2020 continue. I'm very happy to see this show continue and very happy that you've continued to join me. After the matches tomorrow and every match night, you know where to come. Right here, headers and footers. Watch it on YouTube or listen wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for kicking it with me.